First, uh, you know, I, I know this is a, a great intro, I'll just share. I'm Liza, I lead US investments at, at Axion Venture Lab, um, where we focus on fintech investments that are increasing um, not just access to financial services, but affordability and, and well-designed financial products for low-income individuals and uh, small businesses around the world. So um, focus on, on, in addition to the US, Latin America, Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. Um, over the past few years, we've been kind of continuing our, our thinking on, on gender and expanding our thinking on gender um, because we know that women uh, in the work that we do continue to be disproportionately underserved by the financial system. In emerging markets, they're 10% less likely to even have a bank account um, and operate uh, roughly a fifth of small businesses but have a third of the credit gap, so really um, you know, underserved and, and that presents an opportunity. There's a almost $2 trillion credit gap that women, uh, small business owners in emerging markets face, and we see that as a big opportunity for the, the fintechs that we invest in. Um, so with that, um, we'd love to, to introduce here Asya and, and Sheriar um, to kick things off. Maybe starting with you, Sheriar, could you just share a little bit about yourself and, and about your work at Trucker? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm Sharyar. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Trucker. Trucker is a, a fintech based in uh, Pakistan, and we focus on uh, uh, the transportation sector. Uh, we provide loans to uh, truck drivers and, and truck owners, uh, whether they're first-time truck owners or, or have been in the business for a while. Um, this is a sector that has not been uh, previously uh, banked, uh, so banks have not provided financing to, uh, to the trucking industry there uh, for various reasons. So, um, so truckers have had to um, resort to uh, other sources of financing, which includes uh, loan sharks and uh, other uh, sorts of, uh, you know, maybe going to your family. And uh, it's a pretty sizable uh, uh, industry there. Uh, but, you know, for the last 50 years, uh, uh, truckers have been sort of uh, uh, neglected. Uh, so we saw the opportunity there. Um, previously, I uh, uh, had a trucking company, so so drove some trucks uh, myself uh, for a while, and uh, so so we saw that opportunity, and it's actually uh, pretty close to our heart. So 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 we're sort of solving that problem uh, uh, in in the region. Amazing, and I think for for most folks in this room, a uh, Pakistani fintech focused on truckers um, wouldn't be the first the first thing that came to mind when you thought about gender. Um, would love to just understand, I mean, seeing your, your commitment to this grow over the last year has been really incredible. would love to just understand how you first started to think about gender and, and where you are now. Uh, sure. So, um, you know, just like uh, any other company, when we started hiring uh, uh, people, then, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, resumes would come in and we'd hire people. And I'd ask the HR people that, you know, why aren't uh, women uh, interested in joining uh, a trucker? And so they said, you know, that the women just don't uh, like coming to logistics. As I said, that I don't, I don't accept this as sort of a uh, explanation because uh, logistics is a big sector in Pakistan. It's not just driving trucks. There's also, you know, there's sales, there's marketing, there's uh, corporate, corporate sales, corporate departments that have supply chain departments, and uh, all of these areas where women could make a contribution. And so uh, they said, well, you know, they just didn't have an answer to it. So I went searching, and we actually found um, a region in Pakistan, which is in the third desert, which is, uh, uh, you know, like 400 miles from Karachi. And this region um, previously had nothing, but in the last 10 years, uh, they've developed like coal mines and different, uh, uh, you know, uh, power projects in that region. And um, in that region, there's indigenous um, uh, female truck drivers. Like the entire region is covered by just female truck drivers. And I'm like, this is great. I mean, the whole Pakistan has zero truck drivers. And, and this like faraway region in, in the desert has 100% female truck drivers. I said, we need to take this and sort of try and apply this to the rest of, rest of the country. Because if it can be done there, then it can be done sort of. Uh, and that's where we, we got really interested in that. Um, that initiative, and then it sort of all came together because we, uh, you know, we met, um, you know, Axion uh, introduced us to Roots of Impact. Roots of Impact got uh, interested in the uh, 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 the mission, and then they connected us to Riley for Women, um, and so 
And then we started working with USAID also on some initiatives. So the whole sort of thing came came together very nicely. And now we're sort of working towards, uh, you know, this initiative together. Perfect. And that's a fantastic segue. Asya, maybe just kick things off with a little bit about Value for Women and, and yourself and your work there. Sure. Happy to. Can everyone hear me okay? Too loud. Uh, my name is Asya Trotansky, and I'm Associate Director for Inclusive Investment and Business Practice at, at Value for Women. Um, really pleased to, to be here um, and to Axion Venture Lab for dreaming up this event and for helping to lead the charge in promoting gender inclusion in the, in the fintech sector, which is a cause that's near and dear to, to, to our hearts. Um, so a, a bit about us, um, for those new to, to Value for Women. Uh, we are a global organization seeking to make gender inclusion everyone's business um, in the, and in partnership with uh, the private sector. Um, and the idea is that, that we're working towards is, is, or the goal that we're working towards is driving um, improved opportunities for women, be they employees, leaders, decision makers, customers, clients, all across the, the value chain. And we see a lot of potential in working with the private sector actors, particularly in the in the impact space, but not exclusively to to do so. Um, we have a, a we have a global team that's locally embedded in emerging markets. I'm one of two that's uh, based in in the U.S., um, but we work in Africa, Latin America, in Asia, um, and we work with our partners to come up with solutions that are context um, specific and and relevant. Um, and you know what we do with. Uh, how we support trucker in Pakistan is going to look very, very different than how we support um, an, an impact fund that's investing in, in agriculture in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so that's a bit about us, and I'm um, just really happy to, to be here having this conversation. Sure, and, and maybe it'd be great to get a bit more on how you think about this problem specifically and, and what opportunities you see for fintech companies to address gender inclusion. Definitely, and I think you already started talking about this, Liza, but um, we're here because the potential uh, for fintechs to positively impact women is really staggering. Um, in emerging markets, women are 32% uh, of women are unbanked which represents almost a billion women around the world. And even for those women who, who are banked, who have access to financial services, 73% are dissatisfied with the services that they're receiving. It's not meeting their, their needs, their, their preferences, the, their financial needs in their, in their everyday life. So that's a really, really big problem. Um, so why is this happening? Because, you know, most women are still, um, they think that uh, the, the only solution that they see as, as, as sort of the, the way to get banked is through banks. And brick and mortar banks are really hard to access due to um, uh, traditional and sometimes restrictive social norms. Women have restrictions in, in mobility, right, and sort of how far they can travel. They also have, um, you know, what's called time poverty, right, the triple burden. Um, that, that they face in terms of home and work responsibilities, not to mention all of the document uh, uh, expectations in order to, to register for a formal account with, with a bank, right? And so fintechs offer a, a really promising solution. Um, and while they are not a, a panacea by, by any means, um, they can help to overcome some of these constraints around mobility, time, just the complexity um, of, of accessing accounts through, um, uh, through, through, through formal banks. Um, and then maybe just one more thing to say, um, which is that um, for fintechs, right, there, there's just a tremendous trillion dollar opportunity um, in, in, in banking the more of the, of the women's market, right? So fintechs then um, stand to gain in terms of the quantity of customers that they can bring on, but also the quality of customers. There is now ample evidence um, to show that um, women are um, good customers, um, perform really, really well, and are often loyal and take out multiple products um, with different financial institutions. So um, in financial terms speak, you know, they have similar lower customer acquisition costs, they have higher lifetime value to banks. Um, and so tremendous opportunity. Um, sorry, and one more thing, just to paint the picture, which is um, just like, if it's so obvious, right, like if fintechs are so obviously the solution, 
why aren't they already designing with women in, in mind? Um, and there are there have been like 80 page reports written about this, um, but I'll just sort of point to a, a few factors because it's important to think about these as we move into the solutions part of the conversation. So one is just having giant blind spots, right? And making assumptions that um, women and men in a given market will have the same financial needs, preferences, behavior, right? The one size fits all gender neutral approach, which we know does not work and does not respond to women's actual preferences. Um, another piece is having too few women in decision-making power um, in, in, in fintech's leadership and in the product uh, design teams, which exacerbates that blind spot. Um, and again, designing for all, but really designing for, for men and not for women. Um, and then another piece um, is that mm, when fintechs first launch, they have uh, a lot of um, pressure to prove their models as quickly as possible. And they make the assumption, which is actually not backed by evidence, that men are going to be, that men are more likely to be early adopters. Um, and so they design for men, um, and then they fall into this self-perpetuating cycle of continuing to design for men. Um, and it takes a very conscious pause and um, reflection uh, to, 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 to apply a gender lens and to be, become more intentional about designing for women and for men in a given market. Um, the, I just painted a, a, a bleak picture and I didn't mean to, but I, I did want to, I did want to sort of, um, highlight that there are kind of big barriers and obstacles that we as a sector need to work to overcome. And there are promising solutions and ideas out there. And um, I'm excited to get into that as we move forward in the session. Yeah, it's incredible context and I've definitely seen a lot of examples of those challenges and, and also opportunities in our own portfolio. Um, Sherry, for you, um, you're the founder of an early stage company. How do you think about prioritization? How do you think about kind of the right entry point, uh, you know, once gender became a priority for you? Uh, and kind of what's what's next for you as you're thinking about gender? So, um, so for us, it, it wasn't, uh, I mean, from day one, uh, you know, we, we had the mindset to, uh, to hire, uh, you know, men and women both into the, uh, into the sector, right? So for, into our company. So, so for us, it wasn't, we didn't have to prioritize it. It was, it was like, it was a given for us. We just we just faced a lot of resistance when we when we started doing it, and um, I think a lot of it starts with um, you know one of the things that we have decided is that we're gonna make it attractive for women to to enter the space, and that means starting at sort of recruiting at at universities and colleges. So we start talking to because we have a good network there. So we start talking to universities and colleges to 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 place women into those jobs, right? Because they're not the the three, four sectors that women look at first is probably, they don't even look at those sectors. So, so that's sort of what we're looking at in terms of where to start. Uh, one of the things that really stood out for me, uh, I visited Bangladesh uh, uh, last year. And, uh, you know, I, I was visiting uh, a senior government official there. And, uh, you know, he looks at me, he's like, you know, you know the reason why uh, we're doing better than you guys now? And, you know, Bangladesh and Pakistan were, uh, one country at one point. He said the reason is because, and I said, I don't know, tell me. And he's like, don't repeat this, but it's because we, uh, you know, uh, we have women in our workforce, like half, you know, half of the workforce is like women. He's like, that's the real reason. You know, we, we just don't, we just don't like advertise it. I said, well, okay. I mean, that, that's, you know, uh, uh, that's nice. Uh, so, but, but it really stood out because it's, it's, I mean, on some levels it's true, right? I mean, the participation, in Pakistan is 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 quite low, and uh, there's so much talent. It's like talent sitting on the sidelines. Um, you know, I think uh, you know you see uh, energetic women who are balancing, um, you know, home and sort of other things. Uh, and like my own mother, for example, she she's one of the few who sort of um, uh, broke the glass barrier in terms of uh, women law enforcement uh, in Pakistan. So so that's. So she never took like no for an answer. She didn't care. It was a male-dominated uh, uh, space. She just went in and you know now uh, uh, sort of was very senior uh, there in law enforcement. So so it, it's it's very possible. I mean, you just have to have the attitude that uh, you know it can be done and just sort of work on good good policies and good uh, programs to sort of execute that. 
Yeah, and you started to allude to this earlier, but um, I think... I just can't stand the suspense, so how many women truck drivers do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but I want to know the answer to this story. Please, so, women. So, so we, uh, we don't... Yeah, we don't employ truck drivers. We're a marketplace that connects, uh, you know, uh, truckers with uh, shippers. But in that desert region, there's about 250 uh, uh, female uh, truck drivers. What about your staff? Do you have a lot of women that you employ? Uh, so our staff, so we have about 15% uh, women uh, in, in our staff. And we started at about at 0% essentially. So, so we're trying to build that up to about uh, 30, 40% over the next year. That's our sort of target and and it's across so it's not just in one area for example you know if we were to just hire uh, all females in our tech team for example right that's that's okay you can do that but we want it across the board so we've actually hired women operations uh, the, we, we actually hired a female in uh, um, in recoveries in the truck stand which is like a job that even I wouldn't want to take <laughs> so so that's 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 cool that the, you know stuff like that is happening. For sure. Um, appreciate the question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I don't know. Go ahead. I don't, don't want to interrupt if it's not yet question time, but I'm very curious. When I think of trucking and transportation and women, I always think of safety issues. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, truckers are on long roads by themselves. There are inherent safety issues, issues associated. We even see it <coughs> with, with Uber or, um, you know, taxi drivers. There's a reason why it's not common for women to be taking on that role. Speak to what uh, some of those issues are for uh, female truck drivers and uh, So, so there's there's two kinds of safety. Do you mean like safety in terms of road accidents and stuff no, like that, or do you mean uh, safety being a, being a woman, uh, safety of uh, physical, right, uh, sexual right. violence, uh, um, essentially being uh, in a mo more vulnerable position, being out there um, yeah. on the road with without any type of physical security around them. Right. So, so there's, uh, there are organizations that we are, uh, that we're working with. Uh, they focus on, uh, on these kinds of matters. Uh, there's a, it's, it's, there's an organization called CPLC that, that in particular, uh, looks at sort of women's safety in, in the workplace. So working with them to, to build, uh, uh, to build systems where there's a response mechanism. There's a first response, for example, that they can, you know, before there weren't even, uh, I mean, if something happened, you'd have to contact the police. And that's not, you don't really want to do that. You want to sort of, people want to stay away from contacting the police in those kind of uh, countries. So there, there are these uh, organizations that are coming up and uh, they, they, li uh, they liaison with, um, with private sector people to, to sort of make it comfortable for women to, uh, to approach them and, and you can call them and, and sort of get help immediately. And so... So just working with them to sort of, uh, you know, uh, build that. Uh, so, so, so there are ways to, um, uh, to make that environment better. And yes, that, that is a concern. Uh, obviously, that is, that's one of the barriers that prevent women from wanting to join, uh, um, you know, these kind of industries in Pakistan. Yeah. Thanks. And last question on my end before we move into some discussion groups, but I think this is a, a good segue. Um, you alluded to it earlier, but you know, you all, you know, found these women in the desert who are, who are driving trucks and brought this to you know your investors and and others in the ecosystem. Who I think at all levels, both on the investors, you know, our limited partners, but also grant funders and and you mentioned Roots of Impact, have kind of wrapped their arms around you. Would love for you to just speak quickly to the ecosystem and and how some of that has kind of. Uh, enabled this work or enabled you to, you know, make progress um, and and kind of push this work forward. Yeah, I think I think this. I mean, without the support, it makes it a lot more difficult to to uh, to do these things, right? I mean, uh, we're already trying to build a new a new company. There's it has its own challenges. So if you're taking on such a challenge, which is against the wind. I mean, uh, I, d I don't think it would it would necessarily work out too well, to be honest. Uh, so the help is is um, is I think it's uh, uh, it's invaluable. Uh, I don't think we would be able to, to to start. I mean, it's a starting spot, right? And then there's learnings that that uh, 
these organizations have had in different countries, which might be, uh, you know, that, that can be applied to, to Pakistan. So I think that, that helps a lot. So it's both just, not just resources, but also the learnings that, that we, we get to see. I mean, designing a program with, uh, uh, with Value for Women, uh, you know, they worked across uh, the globe in different, different countries. So, so I think that sort of stuff uh, really helps, right, in terms of uh, getting this off the ground. Perfect. Anything to add before we move into? Uh, I'd love to add because I think um, what Sherry really touched on was the importance of bringing women into into the workforce. Um, and I'd like to offer just a few sort of um, guiding principles is too strong of a word, but maybe some, some practices that we've seen um, in gender inclusive product design, like vis-a-vis -vis clients, that sound okay? Perfect. Just to complement. Um, and I think it's best illustrated through another example rather than sort of sitting up here and, you know, walking you all through a, a, a complicated framework. So I'll just talk about one more, um, uh, one other uh, fintech player, um, because I think even though we didn't work with them directly, there's a nice financial alliance for women case study about them that's publicly available, and they do a lot of things. So they exemplify a lot of the principles of gender inclusive fintech design. Um, so this group is called Time, and they are a digital banking group that's focused on um, financial inclusion for the underserved in South Africa. Um, they started in 2019, and in just a few years, were able to bring in. Um, almost 6 million clients, just over half of whom are women. Now, the just over half is actually pretty remarkable because um, unlike microfinance institutions, fintechs disproportionately reach men rather than women. Um, and so there are some um, uh, reasons or some um, factors behind why they were able to bring in so, much, so many women. They didn't start as a women-focused group from the get-go, although they were focused um, on designing for their users um, who are uh, underserved, um, under both unbanked and underbanked in South Africa. And they quickly realized that women were particularly unbanked and underbanked, as is true in many contexts around the world. Um, and so they sought to design an easy to use product um, that women could easily access. So how did they do it? They tried to figure out, okay, where, like, where are the women? Like, where do they, where do they go every single day, right? And so, and one of those places where women go every day is the local grocery store, convenience store to get foods, non-perishables for, for, for their home. And so they partnered with a um, large chain of these little local grocery stores and set up kiosks um, to onboard women to, um, to, to this digital financial product. Um, and they made it very easy to register, less than five minutes. And they didn't leave it to just this little kiosk, which might be intimidating, even though it's in a familiar place, still might be intimidating, right? Like new technology, what is this? They, they kind of brought in um, digital plus human touch. So they set up an ambassador program. They recruited local women um, from these different neighborhoods to, to, to woman the, the kiosks, right? Um, and, and, and bring in new customers. And then the product itself, super easy to use. Easy customer interface, clean, no jargon, no complicated language, no complicated financial terms, um, and available in, um, in uh, how many, 12 of South Africa's um, local languages. Um, so super cool, um, lots of intentional design. One other really cool, well, two other cool things they did. Um, one is they didn't just sit on their laurels, they continued to talk to women, they did focus groups, they did very intentional market research with their women users. And they, and they realized that women wanted other products. They wanted savings products. They wanted insurance products. And so they designed those specifically based on research that they were carrying out with women um, and the conversations they were having. And then the, the other thing that they did was that first on an experimental basis, they started to offer these other products at very low fees. They didn't know if they were going to be profitable or not. And they studied um, the, the performance, the repayment rates of their women users, and very quickly um, saw the, the business case for serving women and realized that they could be profitable even offering these products at very low rates um, because women were such strong performers in their portfolio. Um, so just a lot of intentional design and um, several key principles that I think apply beyond this specific fintech. So one, the not assuming that one size fits all and just 
not assuming in general, like not assuming, right? Like collecting data and figuring out um, what are women's actual preferences and needs um, on a day-to-day basis and using lots of types of data. So market research being one, right? Focus groups, um, observation, and then using their own data, doing sex disaggregated analysis, forming the business case, understanding how are women actually using the product? What are their preferences? Um, And then the digital and the human touch, the go to very intentional go to market strategy, pursuing partnerships with other institutions, right? In this case, the grocery chains for them to actually place their kiosks. Um, And then lastly, the diverse leadership piece. So at this point, only two of uh, their 11 C-suite members are women, but they recognize that this is an area of growth and improvement. Um, And I think Um, you know, Trucker also is really committed to this. I think there's recognition supported by evidence that having diversity in all of its forms in the leadership brings better, uh, better quality in, in decision-making and better services and solutions for diverse segments, including for, for women. Um, so those are some of the building blocks and I'm sure you all have other ideas that we can get into. Absolutely. Now, with that, I want to introduce uh, three other incredible facilitators that we have here today from from different organizations. Actually, let let you introduce yourselves, but maybe we'll start with Daniel. Hi, my name is Daniel Goldfarb. I'm founder and executive chairman of Lendable. We're an impact asset manager. Um, We've deployed about $450 million to fintechs and emerging markets. Uh, We introduced uh, internal uh, DEI and 2X related criteria three and a half years ago started that process, introduced a gender lens to our investment criteria about two years ago, and are now launching our first gender fund. So I've been on this journey and really excited to learn with you all. Hi everyone, I'm Diana Bonjavaguli and I'm a senior advisor uh, focused on digital finance at USAID. For those of you who don't know USAID, this is a US agency for international development. So it's the largest international development agency in the world. Um, USAID provides aid in disaster situations, also funds for uh, economic development of countries, COVID vaccines in the past few years. It's, it only operates in emerging markets, obviously. Um, and I am in the technology division. And currently, my one of my biggest activities is I am managing um, what's called Women in the Digital Economy Fund. And that's a presidential initiative looking to close the gender digital divide uh, in the digital economy globally. And um, there will be a lot of announcements coming out about that soon, but it's a a very exciting activity. (laughs) Hopping around here. Hi, I'm Laurie Spengler, founder and CEO of Courageous Capital Advisors. I focus quite a bit on mobilizing capital, uh, particularly with a gender dimension across investor typologies. So institutional investors, family offices, foundations, and mobilizing it for the asset managers and the entrepreneurs that are going to use it to generate the impact. What I always remind investors is that with respect, they are enablers of impact. They don't actually generate impact. And so if they really want to put their money to work for impact, they need to understand the underlying business models and really think about how they can support, advance, accelerate, especially the achievement of our gender objectives and how they deploy their capital. To also um, add to Daniel's introduction as the gender commitment of Lendable, I am the first female board member of Lendable. <laughs> Keep it even better. Okay. <laughs> um, amazing. And, and Is it, are we back? Oh, okay. I see nodding. Um, Perfect. And before I introduce uh, my colleague, Eugenia, who's going to talk about logistics, I just want to bring two goals that that I'm thinking about and and we'll be thinking about in these conversations. Um, And I'll I'll invite you to think about also, we've been really um, intentional, (laughs) intentional, we've been really intentional about bringing different layers of the ecosystem. So we have investors, debt providers, um, limited partners who are investing in the investors, um, DFIs, consulting, uh, founders themselves. Themselves. And, and two goals I'm thinking about for this conversation are one, in our peer groups, what are the other really interesting things that are happening um, in gender inclusion and, and what can I learn from the other people who are doing what I'm doing on a day-to-day basis? Um, and then we'll mix things up and, and move into mixed groups where we can learn better how to 
uh, how to better collaborate as an ecosystem, what are the opportunities to work together, what's not working in what we're doing now for, for other stakeholders in the ecosystem, and, and how can we start to kind of build those relationships and, and move things forward that way. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Eugenia, who's going to talk about uh, what will happen next. Thank you so much. And we are going to the fun part. If we were on Zoom, everyone would be dropping off because nobody <laughs> likes breakout rooms. But we're stuck here, so we're going <laughs> to... We're going to do a little bit of like engaging activities. Um, so we're going to have three groups. Uh, two facilitators will be leading each group. So we're going to have founders and operators at group A, and we would ask people to proceed there. And Asia and uh, Sherry R will be leading the group with the founders and operators. Don't go anywhere, please. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> No, I'm joking. I'm, I'm, jo <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> then we're going to have direct investors uh, in entrepreneurs and in startups led by Liza from Venture Lab and Daniel from uh, Landable. And then we're going to have a group of LPs, DFIs, nonprofits led by Lauren and uh, Diana. I'm Eugenia, by the way. I'm a head of community at Venture Lab. I work directly with Liza and lead in the community. So I also have cards. I'm going to distribute it for you. And then everyone who has like red, green, and blue, to the second part of our workshop, you're going to come together and kind of see the ways we can collaborate. But it's later on. But I will give you a card right away. So am I forgetting something? I, I think the time, we're going to have 20 minutes for each um, stage. Like we going to discuss 20 minutes first, then we're going to present one, two sentences of each group, like what did you learn, what was interesting, so we're not going to do like a boring debrief, uh, but and then we're going to mix up and going to discuss once again. So we have 20 minutes for each uh, group discussion. Okay. And I think we can start, so again, entrepreneurs and operators led by Asen Sheriyar, just here on this table, and it's like a children's garden, it's very fun. And then we have another group, which is Group B, with the investors um, in entrepreneurs on this stage with Liza and uh, Daniel, please there. And then here we're going to have a group of LPs, nonprofits, and um, who else we have? DFIs, DFIs etc. So, and if you have a question which group you should go to, feel free to ask me. I hope you had a good time discussing in between the groups of your peers, investors, entrepreneurs. So now it's time to do a quick, uh, not debrief, but more like, uh, what did you learn? What was impressive for you? So we're going to share and we're going to start with a group of entrepreneurs and operators. It's literally five minutes because we want to do another round as well. Anyone from the entrepreneurs want to take the lead presenting? Asya? Um, I'll share just two two nuggets. Um, one is we talked about the the difference between having women customers, which is great, um, but that not being the same as actually making sure that the products that you're offering are high impact for women customers. Um, so one of the people in our group is working with an organization that some of you might have heard of, 60 Decibels, to actually validate the, the impact and improve the, the product. That was one. And then another, we... Um, one of the people in our group talked about convincing a bank to better design for women. He operates in a, an advisory capacity. And he said that the way that he was able to do it by looking at their data and showing um, there was a missed sort of, there, like he was leaving money on the table. Like there was this big group of sort of women entrepreneur clients um, that, that weren't being served with the, with the product that they were offering. And they needed to go like a bit more upmarket in what they were sort of in the middle. They needed to design a product to better serve the missing middle. Um, and they and um, looking at the showing them in their own data was very compelling. Wonderful, thank you so much, Asya. And investors, anyone wants to share from you? Oh, everyone is so excited to share. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just share one thing that that I learned. Um, you know, we talk a lot about product design for operators and and for founders and startups, but I think heard two really cool examples of of product design. Um, at the investor level, one being lendable um, in their gender fund uh, using an interest rate step down to incentivize um, different gender outcomes depending upon what the company is is struggling with uh, when it comes to gender. So I thought that was a really cool example of how we as investors can be thinking about product design and, and what that looks like um, with our own capital sources. 
Thank you so much, Liza, and uh, the biggest group. Anyone wants to? Wonderful. We were very participatory. <laughs> yeah. Very participatory, uh, as capital should be. So we really thought, what can you do with being the investor? What can you do to accelerate gender priorities? And the two we're going to share, one is be clear about who you're backing and really think about that. And the second is the power dynamics. So Jail? So I don't know if I've teed, you've teed me up for the right <laughs> talking point. Who you're backing. Who you're backing. shared. It's good. Talking about storytelling? No, no. In, in understanding the who in your in your work, actually women are. Oh, active. so I work within the native CDFI industry, and native women are in leadership roles for eighty percent of the industry, and that's on a board level, and that's on an executive level. In our region of the country, uh, clients served, I believe, is about fifty six percent women. And so the point is, is that women in leadership is normal. And it's interesting to come into this space and to leave our communities and realize that we're not telling a really powerful story that is an example of, um, I don't want to say systems change in action, because I think it's actually, it comes from honoring traditional cultures of the Northern Plains tribes and region and lifting that up. Great. Super. Thank you. And Susie? Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Susie, and I work at the Criterion Institute. And one of the things that Criterion is always known for is being the power people. And what we mean by that is that we think about finance not as a system of capital, but finance as a system of power. So we look at the way to change finance is to change the power dynamics that operate in finance. So we've been working on a system of standards around, or standards of practice around what does it mean to do investment, not necessarily only who you invest in, but the how of your day-to-day -day investment in your process processes in your structures and in your analysis and develop an entire system of standards and practices of analyzing the current power dynamics that are happening in this uh, in a pro process structure analysis and proposing practices that shift those power dynamics um, and really working with asset owners who are understand that they have power and are willing to use that power to shift the power dynamics in finance to help those so really looking at the how of doing uh, investment not just the who you invest in that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So now we go into the second part, and we have 15 minutes to do so. So everyone who has a red card, uh, facilitators, first of all, you stay at your um, spot. So everyone who has a red card, could you please shift to this uh, circle? And then everyone who has a green card over here, and with the blue cards, uh, just if you can follow me outside, it's just in this area. And we're going to discuss how we can collaborate, facilitators will facilitate, and then we will be done, because we're running out of time, and it's been a great conversation.